there's some discussion around the globe about the possibility of a pattern called global warming. I'd like to talk about that a little bit, but in order to do that, I need to use a term that uh, people might find a little confusing. So I'm, but I'm going to use this term anyway as a historical term, and that term I want to talk about, I want to use, first off, is on um, Western culture. I want, to, I want to use the term Western culture to mean something very specific in this context about talking about global warming. And it's because I want to talk about it in a, in a large picture sense of things. Um, the culture that evo evolved, the changes in the environment and the atmosphere that we're now experiencing um, really more or less dates back to the early part of the 18th century. And I want to look at that because something very, very peculiar happened and everyone in the world whether their origins are Western or not, who is involved in this process that's going on is involved in Western culture. So people in Asia who are involved in this process are part of this. They can't, they can't walk away and say, I'm not Western. So when I say Western culture, what I mean is the things that were initiated in the beginning of the 18th century, in which we're now experiencing, and what, of course, what was initiated then, uh, early part of the 18th century, there was a revolution, in a way, in technology. And the first place this revolution took place was in England. And the revolution took place in the use of, or transformation of, uh, coal dug out of the ground. Previous to that time, uh, the energy source and the chemical source for transforming metal, especially iron, uh, had been charcoal, which was made from trees. But starting in the early decades of the 18th century, we saw a shift. It went to coal dug out of the earth. And the coal dug out of the earth was the initiation of the current period of use of fossil fuels in the world. It, it became intertwined so tightly with what we're going to call the Industrial Revolution that uh, it's it's inextricable. The the industrial revolution is fueled by the use of fossil fuels, and uh, the use of fossil fuels signifies the industrial revolution. Even when we look at other kinds of fuels, uh, the the great transformation of the centuries that follow, the 300 years since then, uh, pretty much is is determined by that process. Now, the first thing that happened, of course, was that people learned to dig coal, then they learned to make coke. They used, learned to use coke in the, in the production of metal. And then they, used, they learned to use metal for many, many important things. But among the important things they learned how to do was to use metal to create vessels in which fossil fuels were burned. The fossil fuels turned into energies that spiraled a whole series of things that we commonly think of today as the products of the Industrial Revolution, the first of which were things like pumps, steam-generated pumps. But as we all know, what, what will happen and, and what makes it possible for the expansion of Western culture around the globe and the pace that it expanded was the evolution of metallurgy and the co-evolution along with metallurgy of uh, first steam generation and later uh, using uh, fossil fuels in, in uh, internal combustion engines and, and of course, in uh, electrical generation. So when we think about those things, these are things that never happened before. And what they've done over the past 300 years is they've caused an absolute transformation of the environment that we're looking at. One could make an argument that what they have done is that they've unevolved uh, many, many, many millennia of uh, biological evolution. By going into the earth and extracting fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas. So what we're seeing happening here is that a chemical process created by life over millions of years is being reversed in a period of a couple of centuries. That the carbon molecules that were once in the air were then captured by plants 
and sometimes animals. And then those plants and animals died, and those plants and animals became coal, oil, gas, whatever. When you burn that, you're putting that back in the environment. In other words, you're reversing evolution. Kind of an interesting idea. And uh, the Iroquois prophecy about this, it stated in that this, what, what is seen is the life force from the earth is rising into the sky. And uh, this is, if I may say so, the single most significant thing that has happened in the last 300 years. All the wars, all the politics, all the human things that have happened, nothing comes close to this as a major significance. And people a thousand years from now will look back at this time and they will not see the politicians, they will not see the headlines of the day. They're gonna see that chemical transformation from what was in the earth to be put in the sky. That's what they're gonna see. And the second thing, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Before we get to talk about that too much, uh, let us first acknowledge something. A transformation on that scale, and we're, we're only halfway through the scale yet. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about something that started as a minuscule thing of a few thousand tons of something during one century and has ballooned and exploded to the point where today the amount of tonnage of stuff floating into the atmosphere, even though we know that this is a, a, a thing, a significant thing to worry about, think about, this, this is increasing. Now, the second thing is that um, the, the ideology that currently grips the earth, the people in the world, in the West, has it that everyone should achieve a standard of living which if everyone in the world achieves that standard of living will, will accelerate the amount of fossil fuels that are burned and therefore released into the sky. At first, people were arguing that this wasn't a problem. First, they were arguing it wasn't true that the so-called greenhouse gases were heating up the earth. Now, every time that somebody's doing something in Western culture that's causing changes, that are harming other people, the first thing they do is deny that they're doing that. <laughs> Second thing they do, they hire people to help them deny it. So there was a period of time when, for example, the people who make cigarettes would hire scientists to say that there was no evidence that cigarettes caused disease. Well, we're in the same kind of denial pattern over greenhouse gases. People are saying that there's no such thing. And of course, some energy companies literally put up money to entice scientists to get on board and say that there's no greenhouse gas effect, They're basically prostituting the scientists. I, I point out that th this is standard operating procedure in Western culture. They hire people to lie to you all the time. Some of those people have credentials, so you know, they, they, we don't want to be alarmed by that. I just want to point it out. The, the next thing that happens is that when you have a transformation on this scale that we're seeing, it seems that it's inevitable that it will affect every square mile of surface of the planet, including the polar caps, including the great oceans. It'll affect everything. It'll affect everything, and it will make everything in the world change. Now, the argument's going to be, is it going to be a good change or a bad change? And of course, the people who don't want to see restrictions placed on production of greenhouse gases will argue it's a good thing, and other people will argue that it's a bad thing. But before we even get to that, let's all acknowledge one thing. The changes are taking place. The changes are of enormous significance. That one of the things that they're doing is they're making it environments which have supported some species of plants and animals in some areas of the earth no longer habitable for those. So it's part of the die off that we're looking to comes in micro environments where the environment has changed enough already that uh, species that have existed there for a very long periods of time are no longer able to exist there. I'd like to parallel what's happening with this to uh, human experience. Uh, Any time that a, a human being uh, experiences a degenerative disease of any kind, they can go to the doctor and the doctor can prescribe medicines for 
treating the degenerative disease. But anyone who's realistic about treating a degenerative disease knows that the main person you have to get involved in the treatment of a degenerative disease is the person who has the disease, not the doctor. The doctor can give you this and that, but if the person who has the disease doesn't pay attention to their disease, they're going to get worse. In fact, the, the, the outcome is not good <laughs> for them. So in place after place, enlightened people know that when you go to the doctor, your job isn't done. They don't just give you pills and you go home and take your pills. You also have to take steps to see to it that you do what's necessary for you to do to address your health problems. I have to propose to you that the same thing is happening in the earth. It's kind of important that first we clarify one thing. It is not humankind that is causing this problem. It's Western culture that's causing the problem. Humankind has lived for a long, long time and didn't cause this problem. And there are many cultures in the world that aren't contributing to it. But everywhere that fossil fuels are used is contributing to it. And in that regard, every, the, those places that are doing that have inherited or have embraced a piece of Western culture. Now, as I was saying, if someone is ill, the first person you have to get involved in, the, in their, in their uh, rehabilitation is the, is the person themselves. They're, it's more important than the doctor. I say that and parallel that to saying that people are more important than scientists in dealing with this. Scientists can propose and invent and do different things, uh, but people have to have a consciousness about what needs to be done. People, society has the capacity to not only motivate the development of technologies which are alternatives to this, they have the capacity also to fund that kind of, of technology and they have the capacity to pass laws that forward that agenda. They have the capacity, society does, have the capacity to address this problem. I don't want people to think that you get a bunch of scientists together, they're going to do it. Scientists have to have the backing of society to be able to address this problem. Secondly, other cultures actually uh, have ways of looking at the world which would be very uh, useful at this time. And among those is that there's a peculiarity about Western culture, about its priorities that we need to address and to look at. And that is that Western culture's priorities have to do with uh, material production and consumption of goods and services as a sort of a kind of a, a way of people achieving salvation or redemption or something there. There's an idea here in the, in the culture of the West that many other cultures simply don't have. If we were to move toward a post-fossil uh, fuel uh, society, the post-fossil fuel society would be characterized by some shifts toward a more earth-based uh, culture, more earth-based society. Now, the, the peoples who have that, for the most part, are, are rural peoples, uh, some of them are peasant peoples, lots of indigenous peoples still have the capacity to live that way, to live closer to the earth. It's actually not imaginable that we can address this problem without taking steps in that direction. I think, uh, and it, but there are people who would like to think that. I mean, I, I, I want to interject here that it's, it's not going to be possible. There's, there's a thing about Western culture, too, I want to point out. Western culture has a very strong tendency in its past to act on wishful thinking as though wishful thinking were workable. Uh, the whole culture is filled with utopian ideologies and a lot of unrealistic thought. Among which, by the way, is the idea that something that's popular must be possible to make actual, to realize something popular. So you have lots and lots of people who are a little confused about whether the Star Wars thing is a piece of imagination or is that a, a part of our future? <laughs> They're confused. A lot of people kind of look at the, the Star Trek thing and you can see how people really think that someday it's going to be like that. Well, actually, there's no evidence that it's going to be like that at all. In fact, all of the rational evidence in the world is that the distance between stars is so great that human lifespans don't you know, weather those distances well. And the, the size of, of the universe is very, very large. But you know so many people believe that you can do that. Well, a lot of people also believe that 
science and technology can solve any problem. Well, science and technology have been unable to solve many problems. <laughs> Excuse me. And this is going to be one of them. <laughs> science and technology is not going to solve the problem of global warming. Even were it possible that we were able to halt the uh, production of, of greenhouse gases, the fact is that the process already set into motion will continue on for generations into the future. Several things we need to think about about uh, global warming are that, first of all, its true impact and its true extent are both unpredictable. In other words, we don't actually know what it'll produce and we don't know how long it'll produce it for. We, we do know it'll produce changes. And people are saying, I've heard people say that, well, some of these changes will be good changes. But actually, if you would study the history of civilizations, for as long as there have been stable populations dependent on agriculture, climatic change has always been a bad thing. I, I really challenge you to find me a moment when climatic change benefited a civilization dependent on agriculture. When the climate changes, the agricultural people usually uh, suffer. Secondly, because we don't know how the weather will change, how the climate and weather will change, uh, we're really stabbing in the dark here. Uh, global warming could cause you know, the melting of the ice caps and rising of the sea levels and, and a lot of things that, that when you think of them in an abstract sound like they're manageable. But you know, we can't even manage a hurricane, <laughs> much less something like this. We're talking about something on a scale <laughs> that's monumental, on a scale like the kind of things that happen during ice ages. I say we're talking global climatic change. I, I don't know how to say this in more emphatic terms. This is very, very serious. <laughs> it's the most serious thing going on during these centuries. Next thing is when there's a lot of change of the kind that we're talking about that seems to be about to happen, we really run into a couple of choices that are not well thought out so far. One, one of those is that while the public would like the idea that if we use up this planet, we'll simply move to another planet, you've really got to consider that you're not going to get two billion people on the enterprise, and they're not going to fly off anywhere to colonize another anything. That's not going to happen, and we need to be clear about that right away, because uh, I've heard young people kind of talk like that. They kind of think, well, you know, you get done here, you move to the next place. Well, that's what Western culture has been doing, people. They've been coming to some place, using it up, and then moving to the next place. That's what made for ghost towns and, you know, used up spots. What we're looking at is a puzzle, and the puzzle is how do we adapt to probably fairly rapid climactic change, and how do we preserve the possibilities, you know, do, how do we do no more harm than we've already done? How do, how do we slow down the harm we're doing and then do no more harm? The answer to that is that we can probably look to other cultures that have been adaptive to nature as opposed to cultures that have imposed their will on nature. And that's, I think, one of the real realities that we have about Western culture. It, it isn't adaptive to nature. It, it, it forces its will on nature using technology, well, fossil fuel technology to, to uh, get what it wants from nature. I'm, I'm proposing that, A, you can't do it that way anymore, and B, the models for finding ways to do that reside in other cultures. Not only that, but they're probably somewhat local specific. They're probably microenvironmentally specific, which is to say that in a given area, it's very likely that some of the things that you'd need to know uh, are things that have been known by whatever people are indigenous to or have lived the longest in that particular area. They would know more about what was happening, how things were transforming in their world. Now. That also means that skills that they have could become extremely uh, valuable to us in the future. Now, this is not a, an urging that what we're doing is that we're going back in time. Actually, what I'm proposing is that as we go forward in time, we're going to have to complicate our skills uh, sets more. We, we've been reducing those skill sets. We, they're, they're reduced down to a sort of, you might almost say, a Western toolbox. And we're going to need to. Um, expand those into other 
other people's knowledge bases. Now that, that includes everything from production of food and fibers to the way that people kind of relate to transportation, the way that people relate to how communities are evolved, the, the way that people relate to what a successful community looks like and what people in a successful community do would be changed in a world in which the assumptions that we have about the world we're living in now are no longer valid. So I'm offering to you that changes that would take place in a future world um, might find a lot of information about how to be successful residing in other cultures that have been successful in processes of change. Now, I'm, I'm not really that much of a, of a uh, alarmist in the sense that I think human cultures have always been subjected to change. We, we're getting kind of used to technological change. We live in a world in which <laughs> technologies have changed in our lifetime two or three times the way it feels. It feels like we're living on a very fast track and it's, it's hard to keep up with what we think of as current times. And uh, of course, with the computer revolutions and everything, we, we're thinking that way. But societies have always lived in change. I mean, cultures are never static. And in the history of humankind, the change most often uh, faced by people have been climatic and weather changes uh, over, the, over the centuries. I mean, we can find places where in the fairly recent two millennia, uh, the changes that were most dramatic were human generated. But in all of time before that, and in most of the world since then, uh, humans have been relating to, to climatic changes and changes in weather and introduction of, of plant and animal species and so on and so forth into their environment. What we need to be able to do is to come up with a way in which we acknowledge that the changes are, first of all, they're, they're, they're not stoppable. They're, not, they're like a force of nature. They are a force of nature. And uh, we're going to have to respond to them. And secondly, um, as we're responding to them, we need to be creative about how we respond to them. We need to find ways as the world changes to take advantage of the changes that are there without fighting against the change in the way that we have fought against it in the past. In the past, I think Western culture has been very good at turning a desert into a, um, a non-desert. They pump water there and irrigate it and so on. What's going to happen, I think, in the future is that uh, we're going to find places where, in, in one period of time, it, the, the weather wasn't adequate to raise crops, and it will become adequate to raise crops. And at another place that was once very good for raising crops, it will decrease in the capacity to do so. The other thing I feel is like we're going to need to have a far more global citizenry kind of uh, approach to things. We're, we're going to have to advance our thinking a bit to put priorities about human survival ahead of, of national profits or world trade balances or all those things that economists think of. And this is, this is very unwestern. I mean, the West is almost defined by uh, that kind of thinking, that narrow kind of thinking about that. A lot of people look at indigenous cultures and what they see in indigenous cultures is they say, they will say great that indigenous cultures have a great respect for nature. Well, yeah, but you know, the indigenous cultures I know of in the Americas, the word respect isn't exactly the right word. What they have is, a, is an awe of nature. But what they see in nature is the power of the universe manifested to humans. And when, when, the, when that's how you see, that's what you think nature is, then the question that comes to you is, is how do I respond in the midst of that manifestation? How should I be in that? And a lot of the, the indigenous cultures have spent a lot of time thinking about that. They spend a lot of time thinking about what, what the powers of nature are and how they work, such that you'll find indigenous cultures have very, very high degrees of consciousness about the minutia about what goes on in their world. When Europeans arrived in North America, for example, they found that uh, all kinds of native peoples utilized plants for things like medicine, food, and fiber. Very, very few um, medicinal uses or any kind of use of a plant has ever been discovered which the indigenous people didn't already know about. I mean, they, they had really, they had, they had many, you know, thousands of years in which to inspect their environment and they came to a high degree of consciousness about that environment 
and they knew what their world was about. Even as the world changed, they knew. They knew well enough to be able to identify the changes and to move along, but they lived in a world of a very high consciousness of nature. Indigenous cultures did. And I, would, I just want to propose this. A future dealing with uh, dramatic climatic change would be wise to devise a population that was also highly sensitive to and had a high degree of consciousness about what those changes were meaning and how those changes were manifesting themselves. And it wouldn't hurt for Western culture to finally ad adapt to, a, a, I, I think, a, what is the rea reality of indigenous cultures, which is that uh, nature represents a power of the universe. It's, a, it's an awesome power. There is nothing humans can do, actually, in the face of it. We are, in the end, its subjects. Along the road to this dilemma, uh, we devised a number of ideologies in the West, among which was the ideology of possessive individualism and the whole Puritan materialism that uh, was there sort of at the beginning. And what that did was that that, that created an even wider separation in Western culture from an idea that somehow we are part of nature. In fact, I, I would propose to you that the whole idea of Western culture uh, for 2,000 years has been based on a belief in and a hope for the, uh, the experience of miracles. A miracle is uh, something that happens which contravenes the laws of nature. Uh, someone who died and came back to life, for example, would be a miracle. <laughs> that's a, a, a reversal of the laws of, of nature. And uh, as we know, that's a central theme in Western culture. But we need, we need a, a, a way of being in, in the world in which we acknowledge that we are part of nature, we're product, products of nature, we're, you know, we're part of that. And uh, we need to find a way to become much more citizens of, of the natural world. And really we're about to face, I think, over the next few generations, a, uh, a period in which we either sort that out and start thinking about how we're going to do that, or we're going to face a far more dismal future than we need to ha have to face. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to um, articulate the, a really basic fundamental tenet of uh, indigenous cultures in the Americas. And that is that we're part of a web of something far, far greater. In fact, we're part of something so great that we can't really understand everything about the, the, the rest of it. We can't really, we'll never really comprehend all of the, of the elements of nature. And even if I'm uh, trying not to be uh, anti-scientific, this is not an anti-scientific uh, proposal. I, I agree with science. Science is an accumulation of knowledge and information and so on and so forth. It can't replace a culture's willingness to be subject to the very forces of nature that are absolutely overwhelming. And even the ones that, if not overwhelming, can be very much our allies in the world. So I would like to make that proposal that um, the whole culture needs to have a, a revisited relationship with what it perceives to be nature. Having said that, I'd like to end this with one final observation. And that is that most natural, all the ones I know of, natural cultures, don't have a concept of nature. Because nature, the idea of nature is an idea of an other. There's, there's us and then there's nature. And uh, in most cultures, uh, the two aren't separable. The, the, the concept isn't divisible. And I think in, in like in Iroquois culture, Haudenosaunee culture, there's no uh, real division. We are part of the whole. And if nothing emerges out of the crisis that we're finding ourselves entering, um, we, should, we'll, we will emerge with a consciousness of that, I think, in the long run. It would be better if we had a sophisticated consciousness of it. The indigenous cultures offer some, some ways of doing that. And uh, at the same time, we know that people will do everything in their power to devise technologies to answer the questions which technologies have created. <laughs> There's going to be technologies to solve problems technology created. And that's fine. But in the end, we have to solve the problem that, that 
a human spirit that's a, that's contradictory to uh, the world that produced us, the, the na nature, the natural world. That that is a problem that uh, technicians can't solve. So that's a problem we need to address.